Good morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be His kingdom now and forever. There is one body and one spirit. There is one hope to which we were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Let us worship God. Welcome to this time of worship on the Lord's Day, the Wallace Presbyterian Church. Glad to have all of you here with us. Please take time to sign the friendship pad and share it with your neighbor and greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ. Several announcements in the bulletin that would uh, give you information. We receive our monthly Feed Our Hungry Children backpack ministry offering and there's a, a financial update there for you. Also today is a very important, exciting day as we ordain and install elders as members of the class of 2021. Uh, a final announcement about the retreat next week. I hope that you can come. Notice that it's from 2 to about 7 o'clock, 7.30 next Saturday. Um, Rachel Dole will have some activities for us uh, as a whole group. And then there'll be some breakout sessions. Nancy's going to do praying in color. Rachel's going to have another session. I'm going to sit and talk with anybody that's interested in talking about the scripture passages that I'll be preaching on during Lent. Then we'll eat hot dogs and hamburgers and have some games and handbells and we'll go home. And then on Sunday morning, Rachel will help lead worship with her storytelling gifts. So <laughs> it is Sunday morning. That's right. I was talking about next Sunday morning, Alice. Huh? That's right. But if you can come, if you want to come, we need to know for a head count for supper so you can fill this out and put it in the offering plate or let the church office know by Wednesday of this week. And I hope that you'll be able to take part with us. It'll be a good time of fellowship and nurture. It's good to be with you as we worship God today. Show me the opening sentences as you find in the bulletin. By God's Spirit, we were baptized into one body and chosen by God for loving service to the world. Let us sing praises to God for making us partners in mission. Let us worship God in wonder and joy. Our first hymn is number 396, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship.
gospel calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. As we offer ourselves to him in penitence and in faith, we renew our confidence and trust in Christ's mercy. I invite you to join me in our unison prayer of confession, silent prayers, and our responsive assurance of pardon. Let us pray together. Mighty and merciful God, you have called us to be your people and claimed us for the service of Jesus Christ. We confess that we have not lived up to our calling. We have been timid and frightened disciples, forgetful of your powerful presence and the strength of your spirit among us. O oh God, forgive our foolish and sinful ways as you have chosen us and claimed us in our baptisms. Strengthen us anew to choose Christ's way in this world. Give us your Holy Spirit that each one in ministry may be provided with all the gifts of grace needed to fulfill our common calling through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Lord, hear our prayers. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace we were called as members of a single body. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us sing God's praises for his mercy in our lives. Recently, members of our congregation have started helping pack backpacks, um, but the Feed Our Hungry Children backpack ministry has been going on for quite a while, and I hope you'll look at the information in the bulletin about what an effective ministry this is among organizations, churches, individuals, and throughout the schools in Duplin County. Thank you for your, your offerings.
I'd like to invite the children to join me on the steps for the children's sermon. be Abraham Lincoln hmm? that's right I brought a bunch of pictures to show you and Addie is right these some of them hang in the wall in that room next door that we call the fellowship hall and Hattie B just asked me who is this his name is Alexander Phillips and he was the first minister of this church all the way back in 1884 yeah, he is old. <laughs> and he was the minister here for about two or three years, Alexander Phillips. And I don't think there's anybody sitting in here today that remembers Mr. Alexander Phillips. I didn't bring... You think your daddy does? <laughs> they might. I didn't bring all the pictures, but the, here's a picture of Mr. Curry, and actually there are two pictures of Mr. Curry in that room, this one, and then there's a big painting of him when he's a lot older. But he was a minister here for about 34 years, and that building where the fellowship hall and your Sunday school rooms are is called the Curry Building. It was named after Mr. Curry. Now this picture, this man is Claire Gray and Addie Joe's great grandfather. It's Miss Carla's daddy, Reverend Ozell, and he was the minister here. And Miss Carla moved here when she was in high school, maybe like about 14 years old. And her daddy was the minister here, Reverend Carl Ozell. Now, there are a whole bunch, I think there are about 11 other pictures hanging on the wall I didn't bring there. I'm going to show you these in just a second. There's a story in the Bible about Jesus. When he went out and started preaching, he went back to his hometown of Nazareth, and he went to the church where he grew up, and he preached there. And I started thinking about people from this church who have gone off to be preachers, and they came back from time to time, and their pictures aren't hanging in the wall in that room because they weren't the ministers here. They were ministers somewhere else. So here's a picture of a man named Archie Ferris, and he grew up in this church, just like you're growing up in this church, and he went off and was a minister in other places. That was purple. And here's Mr. Edward Franklin Johnston, and he grew up in this church, and his sister is still a member here. And he was a minister, and then he retired, and he moved down to live at the beach before he died. He was a very, very nice man. And here's Reverend Bruce Powell. He grew up in this church, and there's some people in here that grew up with Bruce. He was a, He's a real character. He still is. I've heard stories about him. But he's a nice guy, and he's a minister over near Charlotte. And then here's a picture of Reverend Jason Davenport. Now, his daddy was the minister here before I became the minister, Mr. Charles Davenport. So Jason was here for about four years and went to school here and was part of the church here. And now he's a minister over in Gastonia, which is near Charlotte, North Carolina. So I just thought about the fact that Jesus grew up in this little town and he helped his father be a carpenter and everybody got to know him and they, they all knew him and he knew them and then he went off and started preaching and he came home and he preached to his home church and they didn't really know what to do about that because they, they remembered him as a little boy. They said, isn't this Mary and Joseph's son? How can he be preaching? But they knew that he was a very important preacher because he was telling them the things they needed to know about God. So, I hope that maybe 
some of you might think about being a minister one day. And I'm going to keep my eye on you and, and talk to you about that. And the people in this church, when you got baptized, they made promises to help you know Jesus and to learn the stories about Jesus. So I hope that whenever you grow up, no matter what you do, if you move off somewhere, you'll always come back to your home church here in Wallace. Let's have a prayer together. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus and for him preaching the good news of your love. And we thank you for people who have been ministers here. And we thank you for people that grew up in this church and heard your word and were taught by their Sunday school teachers and their youth group leaders and then heard you calling them to be ministers. We pray for them and we thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank y'all for coming up. Walking around. our prayer for illumination that you'll find in the bulletin as we ask God to open our hearts to 
to hear his word. Let us pray together. Overwhelm us with your spirit, O God, that the words we hear will speak to our hearts as your word made known to us in Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. chapter 17 verses 1 through 16 and can be found on pages 282 and 283 in your pew bible please listen for god's word now elijah the tishbite from tishbe in gilead said to ahab as to the lord the god of israel lives whom i serve there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word then the word of the lord came to elijah leave here Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Our second Old Testament lesson today comes from 2 Kings. Verse five, I mean, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. It can be found on page 293 in your pew Bible. Now Naaman the com- was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram came out, had gone out, and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard what the king of Israel, that he had torn his robes, He sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, 
I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned off and just went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do a great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Our next hymn is hymn number 772, Live into Hope. Michael to read those two pretty long passages today for a very particular reason, and that is because in the New Testament story where Jesus preaches in his hometown synagogue, he uses those stories as his sermon illustrations. So just a reminder, Elijah goes to a widow in Zarephath. She's not a Jewish person, and God shows mercy to her through the prophet. Then Elisha is sent to Naaman, or Naaman is sent to Elisha. Naaman's not a Jewish person, but the God of Israel has mercy on Naaman and cures him of his leprosy. Those are the stories Jesus uses as his sermon illustrations when he goes back to his hometown and goes to the synagogue. One thing I've always liked in this story is it tells us that Jesus went to the synagogue as was his custom, which makes me think his mother and father took him to church when he was growing up, and that's what he did. And so he, as the story opens, he is out preaching and doing ministry, and then he goes home. And I invite you to hear the word of God. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Isn't this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your own hometown the things we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage they got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. At just 701 words, President Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address lasted about six or seven minutes. In fact, many onlookers were still arriving in the mud when Lincoln finished speaking. He delivered this speech a mere month before the end of the Civil War and only 41 days before his assassination. The unexpected tone and the content of Lincoln's speech have gone down in history as some of the most famous first words ever spoken. On March 4th, 1865, and in the days following President Lincoln's inaugural address, the speech received mixed reviews. Some opponents were very disappointed that the president didn't speak more harshly against the rebellious South. The reporter from the New York Herald wrote that it was strictly, not strictly an inaugural address, it was more like a valedictory speech. That same newspaper criticized the president for not laying out specific terms of peace and punishment or addressing with particulars the urgent problems of the nation. Some critics thought the speech was rambling and incoherent. In his inaugural speech that day, President Lincoln broke precedent, and he criticized the divided nation for the ongoing civil war, and he called on citizens both North and South to consider their sinfulness and God's judgment. The speech was full of biblical language, and in a way the inaugural address was a call to repentance on both sides. Perhaps the most famous first words of that speech came at the very end of the speech when Lincoln said, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wound, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and orphans, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Following the speech, there was a reception held in the White House. Frederick Douglass, the former slave and the famous abolitionist, attended. When President Lincoln saw Douglass, he went over to him and he said, I saw you in the crowd today listening to my inaugural address. How did you like it? And Frederick Douglass answered, Mr. President, that was a sacred effort. In an article about that second inaugural address, which is called Lincoln's Greatest Speech, 
Gary Willis wrote that Lincoln expected some to dislike the address, not because they did not understand it, but because they understood it too well. In a letter that Lincoln wrote to a friend named Thurlow Weed, he called the speech as good as anything I've ever written. But then he said, I believe it is not immediately popular. Men are not flattered by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. To deny it, however, in this case, is to deny that there is a God governing the world. It is a truth which I thought needed to be told, and as whatever humiliation there is in it falls most directly on myself, I thought others might afford an occasion for me to tell it. I thought about Lincoln's inaugural address and the reaction to it when I read Jesus' sermon in his hometown synagogue. They are some very famous first words, and like President Lincoln's second inaugural address, they were not immediately popular. Oh, sure, at first, all spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words coming out of his mouth. But when Jesus started telling stories as illustrations for his sermon, he apparently went from preaching to meddling, as they say. And so the crowd went from praise to precipice. They ran Jesus out of his hometown church, And they tried to throw him off a cliff to kill him because he told some stories. Lincoln's own pessimistic evaluation of how hearers would receive his address is a good description of the hometown folks in the Nazareth synagogue. People are not flattered by being shown that there's been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. In his famous first words, President Lincoln challenged his hearers to admit their need for repentance, to confess their own complicity in the great troubles of the nation, and to extend sympathy and grace to their enemies. Then, as now, those words are hard to hear, especially when we're convinced of the righteousness of our cause and we're feeling secure in our position in life. These words of Jesus in the synagogue in Nazareth are not the first words he speaks in the Gospel of Luke. As a 12-year-old boy, he spoke to the elders and to Joseph and Mary in the Jerusalem temple. As a 30-year-old, he argued with the devil in the wilderness. But these words in the Nazareth synagogue are the first public words recorded in the Gospel of Luke. And in a sense, this is Jesus' inaugural address about his ministry. The keynote or inaugural address sets the tone or theme, lays out the program to come. One source points out that the keynote address or the keynote speech is delivered to set the underlying tone and to summarize the core message or the most important revelation of the event. In his keynote address on the Sabbath in the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus was short on specifics, but his sermon was full of challenges and revelation. In his commentary on Luke, Fred Craddock notes that Jesus' sermon on these verses from Isaiah tell us some very important things. They tell us who Jesus is. They tell us what Jesus' ministry is going to be all about. They tell us what Jesus' church will be and what it will be asked to do. And it tells us what the response to Jesus and his church will be. You've heard me quote Mark Twain before with this saying, but I think it's a wonderful saying. Mark Twain wrote, It ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It is the parts that I do understand. And that seems to be what happened during worship on the Sabbath in the Nazareth synagogue. Jesus' reputation had preceded him from Capernaum. The hometown folks must have reasoned something like this. Well, if he's done all those wonderful things around Galilee, he most certainly will perform miracles here at home, and he'll probably commend us for our faith and our way of life and the way we do things. 
And maybe there was even some hometown pride at work at first. Well, isn't this Joseph's son? He's made good. He makes us look proud. But as they listened to this sermon, the realization slowly dawned upon them. And they heard Jesus tell them stories that they knew by heart. A story about a widow in Zarephath, a Gentile woman to boot, who received God's grace and mercy. A story about a Gentile army commander who was healed of his leprosy by the grace and power of God. At first glance, you might think the good folks of Nazareth were upset by the idea that God's grace, mercy, and love could extend to people other than them, especially people so different from them. That's part of the problem. But they were also upset because Jesus' offer of good news to the poor, of release to the captives, of recovery of sight to the blind, of freedom to the oppressed, meant that they had to admit that about themselves. And they didn't like it. And Jesus anticipated their rejection of his good news because he said to them, you're probably going to say to me, physician, heal thyself. In other words, don't tell us what's wrong with us. How dare you tell us what's wrong with us? You take care of yourself first. Who do you think you are? And they're wondering, isn't this Joseph's son suddenly takes on a whole, whole new meaning? Who is he to talk to us this way? I remember when he was in diapers. Last week, after the celebration of Martin Luther King Day, someone wrote, he didn't give his life, he was murdered. And today we honor a man who was killed for speaking truth to power and encouraging others to believe in a better and more equal world. I thought that tweet very well described the ultimate fate of Jesus as a result of his preaching and in his ministry. Here at the very beginning of the gospel, Luke points us ahead to what awaits Jesus when he finally arrives in Jerusalem. In, in the space of eight short verses, the crowd goes from speaking well of him and being amazed at the gracious words that he is speaking to driving him out of town to the brow of the hill that they might throw him off and kill him. There's no record in the gospel that Jesus ever returned to his hometown of Nazareth. And surely he was correct that day when he said no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. Jesus escaped the mob's action that Sabbath day as he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. But ironically, as has been pointed out, Jesus doesn't go somewhere else because he is rejected at Nazareth. He is rejected at Nazareth because he has gone somewhere else, namely to the Gentiles and therefore to all people preaching and demonstrating God's love, mercy, grace, power, good news, release, recovery of sight, and freedom for all people, not just the good folks in Nazareth. And translating that into today's world is not hard to understand, is it? but it surely is hard to accept sometimes. So as a preacher of the gospel, but also as one who hears the gospel message, I need to listen carefully to what Jesus preached on that Sabbath day. Some of Jesus' words in the gospels are referred to as the hard sayings of Jesus. They're called that, not because they're hard to understand, but because they're hard to hear and to take in and to live out. So are we going to welcome and accept the gospel words that comfort us and support us, but reject the gospel message that calls us to account and challenges us in our strongly held beliefs and in our, the righteousness of our cause 
and our position in life? Are we going to welcome the new thing that God is doing today, or are we going to reject the message that calls us to a new way of life? St. Augustine once wrote, If you believe what you like in the Gospels, and you reject what you don't like, it's not the Gospel you believe, but yourself. In an article she wrote about Jesus' Nazareth sermon, Diana Butler Bass focused in on that one word, today. Jesus read from Isaiah, and then he said, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I thought what she said was very powerful. She says, Today is the most radical thing Jesus ever said. As in, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. She writes, today is a deeply dangerous spiritual reality because today insists that we lay aside both our memories and our dreams to embrace the moment of now fully. The past romanticizes the work of our ancestors. The future scans the horizons of our descendants and depends upon them to fix everything. But today places us in the midst of the sacred drama, reminding us that we are actors and agents in God's desire for this world. She writes, living in God's promise is not about yesterday, nor is it about awaiting some distant Messiah and eternal life in the kingdom of God. It is about now. And this is a hard truth to hear and receive. Jesus' friends refused. They would rather stay mired in nostalgia and complain about the future. How great the prophets were. If only a Savior would appear and get us out of this mess. But Jesus' sermon remains as clear and poignant and as important and as urgent as ever. Today, this promise has been fulfilled in your hearing. What we need is here today. Famous first words of Jesus. The question is, what will we say in response? Actually, the better question is, what will we do in response to these first words of Jesus? And as our Lord himself said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Let us pray. Lord, you bring glad tidings to the poor. Let us hear them also. You heal the brokenhearted. Lord, heal us too. You free the prisoners from their jails. Lord, free us from ourselves. Loving God, please come to us and send us out forgiven to the poor, the brokenhearted, the imprisoned. Amen. As we pray today, let us hold Tanya and her family in our prayers. Her nephew, Tommy Bradshaw Jr., was killed in an automobile accident last Sunday night. Arrangements on Tuesday, visitation at Quinn McGowan Funeral Home at 10 a.m., the funeral to follow at 11. And let us continue to lift up Joellen Fussell and her family, Jonathan and Leah and their family, on the um, unexpected death of Dan Fussell Jr., we continue to pray for Lee Baker. Glad to see her in worship today. And for Andrea as she continues with her treatments. And for Judy Holly. Glad to see Judy here. I have a couple of prayer requests. One is for a man named Dave Velez in Crestview, Florida. Nancy's sister's um, significant other. And he had total knee replacement this week, and she's been sending us pictures that I can't look at of his surgery. 
but he's home and that's good and also I'd like for you to pray uh, for a friend and a colleague that some of you know George Anderson as uh, Gene Park's son-in-law George is the pastor of Second Presbyterian Church in Roanoke Virginia and some of you may have seen this on the news a 20 year old about 20 year old member of his congregation that he has known since birth uh, a student at Radford University was stabbed to death by her roommate it's been all on the news and I've been I emailed with George and said you know lots of love and prayers to you and your congregation and he said it's just horrible so I'd like for us to lift up George Anderson and the staff of Second Presbyterian Church as they go through this horrible event and for that family let us pray together Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Like Christ's first disciples, may we hear his call to discipleship and leaving behind our old ways, live out the gospel in what we say and what we do. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit that we too may bring good news to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive through Jesus Christ our Lord. God of all mercies and giver of all comfort, stand by those who sorrow that they may be upheld as they lean on your strength. Help them believe the good news of eternal life beyond this life. Help us all to live in holiness and righteousness in confidence of a living faith and in the strength of a sure hope. We pray for Tanya and Dan and their whole family as they mourn the untimely death of Tommy Jr. Lord, be with them as they gather on Tuesday to remember him with great love. We pray especially for Tommy's parents in their time of unimaginable grief. Gracious God, we pray for Joe Ellen and DJ and all of the Fussell family as they grieve the unexpected death of Dan. May they be strengthened by their loving memories, the support of friends and community, and the hope of the resurrection through Jesus Christ. God of all consolation, we pray for Reverend George Anderson, for the church family of Second Presbyterian Church in Roanoke, Virginia, and for the staff members there as they try to cope with the shocking event of the murder of one of their beloved young people. We pray for that student's families and friends. We pray for George and the other pastors as they lead that congregation through this most difficult time. And mighty and merciful God, you are the strength of those who are ill. Hear our prayers for Lee and Judy, for Andrea, for Dave, for all others who face sickness and treatments and therapy and recuperation. Grant to them the help of your power that they may find good health and know of your loving care. We ask these things in the name of Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is a wonderful time in the life of our church when we ordain and install ruling elders. And at this time, I would like to ask Wayne Castine and Sam Rose and Lindsay Skidmore to come forward, our newly elected elders, and Elder Michael Teachy representing the session. Hear these words of Scripture, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is one body and one spirit, just as we were called to the one hope of our calling. In baptism, Wayne, Sam, and Lindsay were clothed with Christ. 
and are now called by God through the voice of this church to enter into ministries of service and governance, announcing in word and deed the good news of Jesus Christ. As we ordain and install these elders, let us all remember with joy our common calling to serve Jesus Christ as we celebrate this particular call to these three people. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism. We are marked by, as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. And this is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as ruling elders. Some are called as teaching elders or ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is God's gift to the church, assuring us that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Michael. Representing the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, the session of the Wallace Presbyterian Church now ordains Lindsay Skidmore as ruling elder and installs her to active service on the session. The session also installs to active service Wayne Castine and Sam Rose, who have been previously ordained. At this time, I'd like to ask you, if you're able, to stand and join in affirming our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Wayne, Sam, and Lindsay, I ask you these questions as ruling elders. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity? Will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? And finally, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Michael. Do we, the members of the church, accept Wayne, Sam, and Lindsay as ruling as elders, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Amen. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Amen. This time, I'm, Lindsay, I'm going to ask you if you would kneel here and... Wayne and Sam, if you'd come 
around here. And I would invite any other ordained elders in this church or any other church, any ordained uh, ministers who are here today to come forward and join in the laying on of hands and the prayer for ordination. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called forth leaders to serve you and equip them with your gifts. Among your people, Israel, you anointed prophets, priests, and rulers. You called pastors and teachers, bishops, elders, and deacons to build up your church. With Moses, the 70 elders bore the burdens of your people, ministering in the power of your spirit. Alongside the apostles, deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, ruling elders and teaching elders served together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity of Christ. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you all thanks and praise. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit on Wayne, Sam, and Lindsay, that they may be your faithful elders in this church. Give them prudence and sound judgment, wisdom and courage to order the life of the church in obedience to your word. Nourish them in the life of the Holy Spirit that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion. Guide them in governance on this session and in every council of the church that they may be servant leaders following Christ who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life to set others free. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. Gracious God, through the waters of baptism, you have claimed us as your own and called us to share in Christ's ministry. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us that we may discern the gifts you have given, calling them forth from one another, and together use these gifts for the good of all. In obedience to Christ, in the unity of his spirit, may we proclaim good news, make disciples, be light and leaven, share our bread, offer a cup of cold water, wash one another's feet. Make us strong in Christ to live as your people and show forth your saving love in the world by the power of your Holy Spirit, and always to your glory forever. Amen. Help Lindsay get up. <laughs> Wayne, Sam, and Lindsay, you are now ruling elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Welcome, and I invite all of you elders to extend the right hand of fellowship.
We continue our worship as we present our tithes and our offerings. Thank you for raising up faithful messengers and sending your son Jesus to draw us close to you. Lord, give us the ability to listen and obey you. Direct our efforts to fulfill your will in our lives and as part of this congregation. May our offerings, gifts, and service bring joy to people here in our neighborhood and around the world. We pray through the word made flesh, Christ our Lord. Amen. I had a text this morning from Dottie Obenauer. She and Bob are living down in Wilmington right now. They've been sick for the month of January. 
And she said for me to let you know how much they miss their church, how much she wishes she could be here today to lay hands on the elders and pray, and how much they love you. So love and best wishes from Bob and Dottie Obenauer. Our final hymn is number 721, Will You Come and Follow Me? into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Amen.